Five Five. Again, I'm Mike Walsh, and today I have with me two members of the retired Bartlesville Act Tough Profits, Nathan Woodworth and my uh, my brother, Danny Walsh. Uh, we're going to be doing things a little bit different uh, this time out. Actually, we're just going to kind of fly off the seat of our pants and just make it up as we go along. Uh, one thing that hopefully I will get done before the end of this episode is review Blackfoot Gypsies. What's the name of the album again, Nathan? On the Loose. On the Loose. And they're from Nashville? Yep. Nashville. Right. From Nashville. <laughs> from Nashville. They're not a Nashville artist. Yeah. They're from Nashville. They go there. They're from there. There's a difference. <laughs> That's the way to be from there is they fuck. <laughs> <laughs> Unfortunately, they don't get wrapped up in that whole writing thing. Mm-hmm. But um, anyway, uh, since I got you guys here, I know that Tough Profit's kind of in a uh, semi-retirement. I, y'all were jamming, you said, in the what we call the doghouse. Yeah, we got a doghouse. It's our uh, little studio that Carrie's got. Carrie Chubb's our lead singer. Steve Sutherland and Jesse Cavler, the missing guys. Uh, we have a little place called the doghouse. That's where we gather to uh, hang out, get inspired, practice, whatever. Uh, it hasn't been used much over the last year or so, so yeah, we kind of got things fired back up. You know, Very it's cool. nice. It's, yeah. it's like a home away from home. When was the? When was, how, how long have y'all guys been on your hiatus or retirement? How long has that been Two, officially? 2011 was the New Year's Eve show when we officially stopped the bookings and all that stuff. And then we did a couple of charity events throughout that year, and then uh, uh, January 2012, we actually did our last five of us got together in performance. And uh, since then, we've all just kind of. Yeah, I'm taking the yeah, it's kind of. So it's been about a year then. Yeah, about yeah. a year since we really even thought about playing front piece or anything. Right, right, right. Well, uh, give me just a little bit of history. But if I recall correctly, the first time I saw anything with Tough Profits name on it was something that you showed me. I think it was a little CD, and it had Carrie and I can't uh, the other guy, the original guy, uh, Matt, Matt Garrett. Matt Garrett. Matt Garrett. Yeah. Just those, that's how that's how it started. Right? Yeah, it was Matt Garrett uh, and Carrie were the original Tough Profit gentlemen, and then me and Nathan was in a band. From Called Thirty Nine Hill Band, and uh, and Brandon Black mm-hmm. came on board, and the three of us basically had no fundamentals of the music. I played in a rock band back in the too, but it was synthesizers. It really, it was just making sound with the drummer in the background. But this time around, uh, we got this project it was like learning music from the ground up. Yeah. He had learned drums, I had learned guitar, uh, Brandon learned bass and harmonica, mm-hmm. and then we met uh, uh, Carrie and Matt. Uh, we kind of merged that together and, and started experimenting with it and went after a sound that was kind of the Johnny Cash, uh, David Allen Cole, uh, Waylon Jennings type of stuff with a little bit of rock flair to it, a little bit, just looking for that show to energize. Yeah. Right. And something the different than everybody else. The old fashioned stuff. The stuff that you listen to going down the country road, you know, regular beer. You know. Speaking of learning your instruments, I believe the you learning the drums was a pretty interesting story. How did that go? Well, basically, I, I mean, I always wanted to play drums when I was a kid, you know, watching Danny's old band from back in 92 or 1 or whatever. And, uh, you know, I always focused on the drummer. It just, it was, it was, it just went through me and stayed. Uh, and I had a car wreck like 10 years ago and had to set out a semester of school. And I was like, fuck this, man. I'm buying drum set. <laughs> And Danny helped me find that Mapex from kit. Jay Wilson. We bought it off Jay Wilson, which is one of the best drummers I know. And just, you just learned. It. Yeah, I mean, no like, pun intended. You just pounded it out. Exactly. <laughs> yeah. We had Jeremy Jack. Yeah, his dad was a jazz drummer in England. And, and, yeah, and I, I had a lot of pointers from Doug Weimar. Oh yeah, Carlo. Yeah, Carlo. Those guys taught me everything I know. But just had a natural, had a natural beat about me. We just took it from there and started at the bottom. And then y'all went up. So that was you know about 10 years ago. So you went all the way to 2012 playing pretty much nonstop as Tough Rock. Constantly. One, you won, uh, what was it, the, the Payne County Line Best Red Dirt Band of the Year? Yeah. yeah. Didn't you steal that from Cross Canadian Rock? No, we didn't steal it from. <laughs> that whole thing was based out of Stillwater, and what it was, it was a fan base competition. Right, right. And basically, if your fans went to that side, they could vote. Uh, they had all these categories from sound people, lights people, uh, uh, every drummers, you know. And we never was going after that red dirt thing because yeah. we weren't from Stillwater. Yeah, we, we we wanted just to play music and do the southern rock outlaw, just yeah. have fun, you know, bar variety music. If we got free beer, that was enough pay, yeah, that yeah, type yeah. of stuff. But, and if someone would stay and listen, that was even better, <laughs> you know. And uh, but we came up with that that show. 
uh, even though we did not know what we were doing, we just drove it. And I think the Merle Haggard thing we did down here at the Cocoa Ranch, that came early on. Uh, that forced us to, uh, for the guys to write the originals because we couldn't do covers at it. And we've never done anything like that. We were still at EAG and DCG, basically. <laughs> there you are playing in front of a huge crowd. Oh, and yeah. And from Merle Haggard. That was scary. <laughs> Thousands of people. And yeah, you know, backstage with celebrities. And, and something happened when we walked up on that stage. It, I think that's when this band happened. Yeah. Because we, we actually went with the idea that we were going to go on that stage and fail. And they were going to pull us off the stage. But we looked at it like, all right, we'll, we'll do this. And we failed from all these people and stuff. Big deal. We can, for the next several generations, we can tell grandchildren we opened from all yeah. you know, And we can live with it. Right. But unfortunately, we, we pulled it off. We flipped the switch and, and it set exploded. off that energy. Yeah. It exploded. Uh, there was uh, people from Kane's. Down the ramp when I came down with the uh, promoter uh, Max asked how was it because I told him right when I gave him money we've never done this before <laughs> he's like what well, that's, yeah and I said the only thing better that would be play the Kings Ballroom and wow uh, there was a guy standing up we can have it. we can do that so we did Kings Ballroom which is legendary that's that's the ideal place to play at North and Salford yeah. and we did it five times in two years. That's yeah. awesome. Yeah, it's just from a bunch of local guys out of Marsville. Yeah, I know a lot of I know a lot of local musicians, at least around here, hear that story. It's like you just fell into opening for Merle Haggard. Yeah. You were still learning chords, and then right that night you got booked at Canes. Okay, so like uh, the one thing that I think was like most magical, at least part of my experience with Tough Profit, was actually going to the show and the energy level. You know, even if <laughs> let's not let's not. Uh, Beat around the bush. There were sometimes I saw you guys completely wasted. Oh, absolutely! Just completely out of your heads, and it may have been mistakes. It might not have been a perfect show, but it didn't matter because of the energy level that you fed to the crowd was just magic. Well, it's yeah. called the NASCAR theory. Is what I've always called that. Yeah. So if you go to a NASCAR race, how exciting would that to be? Sit there in the stands and watch those cars go around that track, two hundred miles an hour, and never have a wreck. All right. Sure. So if you go to a show. <laughs> Go to the race races and you watch the cars go and there's a spectacular crash. No one gets hurt, but they're just flipping and going. You know, you know there's wrecks. That's exciting. That's what makes you want to go to those. Actually, people don't admit it. But that's what it is. Kind of use that theory with Tough Profit. Uh, yeah, if we we could sit around and rehearse and drive ourselves insane, be perfectionists. Uh, instead, we kind of went with the attitude since we are not seasoned musicians and we're still learning. And of course, you'll always be learning. But we were down at the very yeah. level one yeah. learning. And uh, so the idea was let's don't worry about making these, if we do a cover song, make it sound like a cover song. Let's make it sound like a cover profit song using those lyrics with our drive of music. And, uh, and don't worry about the reps because actually people enjoyed that. If they saw you mess up, it was so cool someone come up to you after show bed and wow, I saw you messed that up. But I had other seasoned pros tell us, you don't ever want to worry about that because 90% of the audience, or 99% of the audience most of the time, have no idea if you make a mistake. You know, they're not musicians. They don't know that you missed that chord or you didn't hit those intricate notes. They want, they want to feel the show. And if you're having a good time on stage, they're having a good time in the audience. And that's what, that was what was attracting people. Yeah. You know, we didn't have no fear of being embarrassed. Yeah, I didn't. Messing up really wasn't an issue. Mm -hmm. It was just about, you know, because we messed up a lot, you know, in the beginning. Oh, yeah. But, but when things were right, oh, man. And, and you, it, it just, it like changes. There's a feeling that comes in. It's like, yeah, this is what it's supposed to be about. And all the little fuck up stuff. Like no. Shit and, and, uh, right, right. And you get on a big stage. And it just that's when we realized we had something yeah, because like played the bars get drunk I, I don't like you, you, you played and it just the bubble once we, every now and then we did the big shows then we knew there was something about the five of us that when we got together it, we never failed on the big stage you know we, we, had a, we had a group of driven dudes man Harry Cho he's, he's a go-getter man a thousand <laughs> songs man yeah, I can memorize anything when he wants something he gets it Get your done. Well, I want to say, if it wouldn't have been for him, I probably wouldn't have played. I mean, we were playing with Jeremy and stuff in the, in the garage, but, you know, Kerry decided he wanted to play guitar and sing a little, and he did it. And he, I mean, it was like a, a train engine to the train. Yeah. And, <laughs> and we just got on a road with him. Uh -huh. he, well, he, he is, uh, I, I will admit, him standing center stage, uh, the big guy cowboy had a pretty damn commanding. Oh, yeah. yeah grabs your yeah. attention and then on top of that you know commanding charisma that he had and he'd smile it was all of a sudden like 
hey, I'm here with you guys. Yep. I'm, all parts. All good. I'm, I'm, I'm here with you. You're here with me. Let's just have a good time. And it was such an uh, organic experience watching you guys with your with your audience. And everybody's got shit eating grins from ear to ear, oh, yeah. band and audience. And it was it's amazing. I mean, I've seen I've seen bands that are amazing live, but they're you know separated. And you're watching them perform, and that you're not there to them. And that's cool, I guess, sometimes, but, um, you know, to be a successful local act or even a regional act um, and getting that audience night after night after night after night, the way you guys did it is genius. Yeah. If you're, and we just kept it simple. With them. Yeah. Kept it simple. That's did it our way. Do. Yeah. <laughs> we didn't care about the business aspect of it mm-hmm. or any of that stuff. We, you know, of course you want money. You know, you got to have money to do all this stuff, but... You got to keep in mind. It's not about the money. It's not all about the money unless you're going, unless you're going to do it full time, and uh, you want to be in that world. Uh, we wanted the best of both worlds. We want to still have our lives, yeah. have our family, jobs. Well, we, we all had full time jobs. Jobs, yeah. yeah. And, and, and it was a, it was a weekend project. But it still popped 150 in, shows a year. Out. Turned yeah. in. What was the three nights a week sometimes? What was the height of that? How many? What was the there most was, amount of shows you did? There's one year, according to the records that I had, we we just. Bump 200 shows in one of them. There was that one year. It climbed all the way up to that, and I think that's when the, the burnout was starting to set in. We were playing every Tuesday, every Friday and Saturday, uh, and we said no to nothing. Nothing. And it was one of those times that we, because we also, uh, I think it was a cool factor of this band was uh, if someone asked us to do a charity show, we're there, no matter where it was. And it was that one time we drove all the way to Drove, Oklahoma during the daytime to raise money for some other bands uh, to do a show, and then Loaded our stuff and drove a couple hundred miles the other direction to do a show that night. Wow. You know, and, and you know, so you spent your whole weekend sometimes not making a dime. But when you did those charity events, those were the bigger crowds. You, you felt good for what you were doing. You know, it's like cleaner our sins. Got <laughs> yeah. They also got press. Got lots of free yeah. press. It was, yes, it he was playing fun. for free works. Yes, it does. <laughs> it does. It, 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 it's a long process, but what you do, you'll get back in return. Yep. Uh, it is totally. I've seen it where people try to just make a business out of it, and that's what people are seeing in the audience. Mm-hmm. So if you've got these guys that are in there playing on stage, just want to be there and do it. That flows into the audience. It's, it's all about, you don't have to be perfect, you don't have to be fantastic, you just got to have something that either one or two things has got to happen in there. They've got to either want to sit there and really listen to it and have a good time, or they want to dance to it. Yeah. And we never really was a dance band. Oh, but, but when we rocked out, you know, we, those notes that we did, we, we really didn't, we had a mixture of people. You know, Carrie, country. He's Mr. Johnny Cash. You know, he had that country thing in him. Steve Sutherland, the blues. You know, me and Nathan loved the rock. You know, it was, all, it was rock. And uh, Jesse Talbot was from a rock band. Uh, we had a rock rhythm section and a uh, yeah. blues lead and then a country voice. Yeah. 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 Made it. Steve, Steve Sutherland, he, he sang a lot too. Oh yeah, I mean it was. He's a great probably yeah. probably half and half between him and Carrie. Just like the album, yeah. yeah. Uh-huh. It tells Plato Alley, it's half Steve and half Carrie, and they wrote the songs. Yeah. They're songwriters. Yeah. Uh, Steve is a phenomenal guitar oh, player, man. singer. He's he's got probably one of the best voices that that I know. That's mm-hmm. awesome. straight up. And the nicest person you'll ever meet. Yeah, yeah he, is a, he is an incredibly nice guy. I only got to hang out with him a few times, but every time it was completely like, hey, I've known you for years, man. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, that was the thing about our band. Like, you know, we all we all got along. Yeah. Like family. I mean, we are, but... Now, you know, well, Jesse Tabler, you know, besides his murder convictions and all that stuff. <laughs> <laughs> gotcha! <laughs> He's going, oh, crap, he's talking about it. <laughs> well, let's, let's go ahead. Nathan, tell me a little bit about uh, how you discovered uh, Blackfoot Gypsies and, and why you think I should review this thing. I discovered the Blackfoot Gypsies on a drunken night at the Mercury Lounge in Tulsa. <laughs> they were remembered it. Yeah. <laughs> they, they, were, they were the opener for the Dirty River Boys and uh, it's they absolutely killed it. <laughs> um, yeah. Well you were know. pretty excited when you brought it over, so what yeah. I had it, um, um, and they were going to be playing at the Mercury Lounge in Tulsa. Uh, what was the date on that? Uh, Tuesday, March 12th. Tuesday, March 12th at the Mercury Lounge in Tulsa, which well, I'm going to try my best to make it out with you and doing that. But yeah. right now, what I'm going to do is I'm going to take a good hard listen to this, get my ideas about it, and I'm, then I'm going to tell you about it. So uh, stay tuned. I wandered out last night looking 
This is the Nashville sound you've been looking for. There's something majestic about stripped-down rock and roll. Honestly, I personally can't put my finger on it, but I think if Jack White taught us anything, it's that you don't necessarily need a whole lot of people to capture the spirit of our beloved music style of choice. I guess, if anything, it helps to distill the essence of rocking if you slim down the creative input. And that's exactly what Matthew Page and Zach Murphy of the band Blackfoot Gypsies have done here. They have let the music ferment to perfection, then they bottled it into an incredible auditory mixer. On the Loose is a fantastic voyage in old school rock and roll. Personally, I adore a modern band playing rock music the old fashioned way. I mean, letting the blues takes over really reminds us of where rock came from and why we love it. This record is the very definition of driving music, by the way. When I was listening to the vinyl, the whole time I longed for the open road and all the freaky roadside attractions along the way. Another thing, you know, it, it's fitting that these guys are from Nashville. I mean, let me explain. If you were to ask me one genre of music that I absolutely hate, the answer would be modern Nashville country. I can't stand the engineered pop music that passes this country these days. And it's a well-known fact that if you hit the bars in Nashville and are lucky enough to see the real writers of those terrible songs, when they perform them, they come alive and they can truly be great. Well, the Blackfoot Gypsies, at least geographically, are from that world. But they figured it out. They found the sacred scrolls that so many Nashville record labels don't want you to find. Matthew and Zach know how to make music fun, enchanting, and downright intoxicating. You, I mean, you can almost see the smiles on both their faces as they play their music. You might find that their two-piece work derivative of another <coughs> White Stripes famous act, but give it a chance. Because at its core, On the Loose has no pretentious leanings. It has no delusions of grandeur. And it's as if the band wants you to have fun with them. I mean, what more could you ask for? If all the output from Nashville was like this, I just might have to move the garage there. Unfortunately, that's not the case. But as it stands, you owe it to yourself to check these guys out. Yeah, That's what I woke up to this morning. The garage is kind of, kind of a mess. Yeah, I had some kind of good time up here. We did that. And uh, Clown, he's uh, seen better days. Whew. 